Just a couple of weeks ago, the American Psychological Association released the results of their annual survey on stress. It was alarming. Turns out that Americans are feeling more stressed today than at any time in the 15 years that the survey has been taken. Now, you don't need to be a psychologist to figure out the sources of that stress. Inflation and financial pressure tops the list, followed by global uncertainty over the war in Ukraine and lingering fear and anxiety related to the pandemic. The CEO of the association sums it up this way. The number of adults who say they are significantly stressed over these events is stunning relative to what we have seen since we began the survey in 2007. Americans have been doing their best to persevere over these two tumultuous years, but these data suggest that we're now reaching unprecedented levels of stress that will challenge our ability to cope. As a result of this stress, uh, people reported unhealthy weight gains or losses, disrupted sleep patterns, drinking problems, poor performance at work, marital and family strife, and a variety of mental health issues. Now, I'm sure this comes as no surprise to any of us. Stress can be defined as a feeling of emotional or physical tension prompted by an event or threat that makes you feel frustrated, anxious, or angry. Now, if that's how you felt watching March Madness this weekend, that's not the kind of stress I'm talking about. I, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'm pretty sure we've all felt frustrated, anxious, or angry these past couple of years. And some of us are likely feeling those things today. And chances are many of us have experienced some of the negative impact of that stress on our lives and relationships. Now, if all this is making you feel more stressed than you were a couple of minutes ago, I have some encouraging news for you. Today, Jesus is going to change the way we think about stress. This is week four of our Change Maker series. We're walking through the events of Holy Week as we make our way toward Easter. And along the way, we're discovering the changes Jesus made and wants to make in our lives and the world. So far, Jesus has changed the way we think about leadership and power and religion. And today, we'll see what he has to say about stress. Now, we don't typically use the word stressed to describe Jesus. It somehow seems too human or mundane. But you could easily argue that Holy Week, the final week of his public ministry, was the most stressful week of his life began with Palm Sunday, which may have felt like a bright and shining moment to the crowd and the disciples, but Jesus could see the storm clouds on the horizon, and he was already feeling the weight and sadness of everything that was ahead. The stress level increased on Monday as Jesus shook things up at the temple, stirring up controversy and conflict. The next couple of days, Tuesday, Wednesday, found Jesus in increasingly heated exchanges with the religious leaders as they debated theology and politics and who will be married to who in heaven. His stories became increasingly dark and disturbing as he talked about judgment and the end of the world. On Thursday evening, he and his, his disciples gathered for what should have been a celebratory meal, but the simmering tension broke through as the disciples argued over who was the greatest, and Judas abruptly got up from the table and slipped out into the night. After dinner, Jesus suggested that they go for a walk. But it, it turned out to be more than just an evening stroll. It was the beginning of a journey, a journey that would change everything, including how to handle the stressful moments of life. So let's walk our way through the story and see what we can learn. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. 
and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, it was customary for people to take walks in the cool of the evening after a meal. Jesus takes them to what seems to have been a familiar place, an olive grove called Gethsemane. Now, we don't know if uh, this was the exact place, but, but we can imagine it, it would have been a peaceful place, conducive to prayer. And that's why Jesus has come here. He leaves most of the disciples there at the entrance to the garden, but he invites the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him to the place of prayer. Uh, now, now, these are the same three that were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, where they saw Jesus glorified and asked if they could camp out for a few days. This was going to be a very different experience. Uh, we're told that Jesus was sorrowful and troubled. In other words, he was sad and, and conflicted on the inside. By his own admission, his soul is in distress, stretched to the breaking point. Remember our definition of stress? A feeling of emotional and physical tension? Stress is our body's reaction to threat and pressure. It affects every part of our being, body, mind, and spirit. And, and, and so it was for Jesus that night. One of the other Gospels uses the Greek word agonia to describe what Jesus was feeling that night. Well, this is a, about as human and vulnerable as we've ever seen Jesus. And up to this point in the Gospels, we've seen Jesus hungry, tired, thirsty, mad, sad, and occasionally exasperated. But this is the first time we've seen him like this, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. It sounds strange to describe Jesus as stressed out, but this looks an awful lot like it, doesn't it? And we can understand why. He knows what's waiting for him the worst kind of physical pain and suffering, public humiliation, personal betrayal and abandonment, grief for what his family and friends are about to witness, false charges, unjust sentencing, and an excruciating death. And worst of all, estrangement from his heavenly Father. H however stressed out you might be feeling these days, or at any time in your life, know that Jesus has been there. He's able to sympathize with us in our weakness, the Bible says, and has been tested in every way, just as we are. And Gethsemane leaves no doubt about that. Now, we all know what we're supposed to do when we're feeling stressed. Take a deep breath, get some rest. Get some exercise, get some fresh air, call a friend, meditate, or my go-to coping mechanism, have some ice cream. And sometimes those things help. But sometimes our best efforts to manage stress come up short. So Jesus goes to the garden to teach his disciples and us what to do when we're stressed out. He teaches us to pray. Let's keep reading. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. How do you picture this scene in the garden? As I was working on the message in my office just the other day, I, I looked up and, and noticed one of the pictures on my wall, a print someone gave me years ago of Jesus praying in the garden. Is that what it looked like? A stained glass moment of piety? Or did it look like, like this familiar portrayal? A poised and prayerful Jesus, gazing beatifically toward heaven as a halo of peace encircles him. 
I'm, I'm guessing it was more like this. A prostrate Jesus, flat on his face before the Lord, in the dark, with nothing to offer but a plea that he not have to go through with it. That was Jesus' prayer request. Don't miss that. He asked the Lord to make it go away. The, the thing that he was supposed to do, the suffering that he was about to endure, he doesn't want to do it. So he asks the Father for a way out, for some other way. Now, it wasn't an unreasonable or an unprecedented kind of request. I mean, generations earlier, when God was about to judge the nation, Moses asked him not to, and, and Yahweh relented. The nation was spared. King Hezekiah once asked God for more time when he was told he was going to die, and God granted him 15 more years. And maybe Jesus was remembering Abraham on Mount Moriah, lifting the knife to slay his son, only to find at the last minute he didn't have to go through with it, that God had provided a lamb in the thicket for the sacrifice. So maybe in the end, he wouldn't have to go through it. Maybe his wise and loving father would provide another way. Jesus ends his prayer by acknowledging that it's the Father's will that matters. But he's not quite ready to embrace that will. This conversation isn't over yet. Now, earlier in the Gospels, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And he did. He gave them, and us, a template, a model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, here in the garden, Jesus not only teaches us how to pray, he shows us how to pray. So let's pause for a minute here and, and consider what Jesus is teaching us. When we're stressed out, when we're feeling sorrowful or troubled and overwhelmed, to the point when we're not sure we're going to make it, when rest or exercise or a bowl of ice cream just isn't going to cut it, Jesus teaches us to pray. So drawing on his example, let me offer a few practical suggestions for praying in times of stress. First, find a time. Find a time. I mean, notice how intentional Jesus is here. After all that's happened that week, and after an unsettling evening around the table, Jesus knows he needs to pray. Now, we, we've seen Jesus finding time to pray all through his ministry, early in the morning, late at night, pulling away from the crowds to be alone. Intentional prayer has been a lifelong practice for Jesus. So, so in a season of stress, he knows what to do. Have you found times to pray? Moments of the day or a week that you set aside for prayer? first thing in the morning, after the kids are out the door or down for a nap, your morning or afternoon commute, before bed. If you're in the habit of finding time to pray on ordinary days, you're more likely to find it in times of stress. So find a time. Secondly, find a place or places. Uh, we get the sense that Jesus has come to this place or places like this before to pray. It's interesting, Judas knows exactly where to find Jesus that night. When you're feeling stressed, having some familiar places and conducive places makes it easier to pray. A favorite chair at home. Some place outdoors, quiet, scenic a church sanctuary, a vacation home. There, there's a spot I often go to out at Great Brook Farm in Carlisle. I'll often stop there on a run or a cross-country ski just to spend a few minutes with the Lord. 
And usually it's a place for praise and thanksgiving. But more than once, I've poured my heart out to the Lord in that place during a hard time. Do you have a place or two or three you go to pray? Do you need to get to that place this week? So find a time, find a place, find a posture. Uh, we're told that Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Stress is a physical thing as well as a mental and emotional thing. And so sometimes prayer needs to be physical too. Just turning your palms upward as if letting go of something or receiving something. Raising your hands in worship or surrender. Kneeling in submission. More than once in my life as a pastor, I have found myself flat on my face in the office or the living room floor overwhelmed in a stressful season. I've got nothing, Lord. I need your help. Body language counts, even in prayer. What are you saying to God with your body? Find a time, find a place, find a posture, find some friends. Jesus specifically asked Peter, James, and John to keep watch with him. He needed to do business with his heavenly father, but he wanted his friends nearby, standing, sitting with him in prayer. And so sometimes it helps in a time of stress to invite a few others to stand or sit or kneel with you, even from a distance. Now, there's a certain amount of vulnerability in doing that, but it puts our hearts in a receptive place and, and it lightens the load to know that others are carrying it with you. Family members, friends, your small group. We always have folks who are willing to pray with you after a service, in person or online. Now, whoever you turn to, hopefully they won't fall asleep on you. So find a time, find a place, find a posture, find some friends, and finally, find words. Not, not the right words, necessarily, but honest words. Just, just begin where you are. Jesus is honest with himself and his friends and, and his heavenly Father. He's sad and he's troubled and he's overwhelmed. When we're stressed out, our, our feelings are usually all over the place. They're not always pretty or coherent. That's okay. Just Begin where you are. Try to find words to, to describe what you're feeling or thinking. Lord, I, I don't understand why this person I love is so sick. Lord, I'm tired of waiting for a job to come through. Lord, I'm afraid for my kids and the direction they're heading in. Lord, I... I feel like I'm losing my grip. Choosing words brings clarity to what you're feeling and to what you're asking. Even if you're not exactly sure yet what you're feeling or asking. That's why it can be helpful to pray out loud or, or to write out a prayer. Remember, prayer is a journey, not a transaction. We don't know where it's going to lead. The words you begin with may not be the words you end with. But all you can do is begin where you are, which is what Jesus does. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He's looking for a way out. Now, fortunately for us, he's not done yet. Let's keep reading. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's interesting he calls out Peter. 
Uh, wasn't Peter the one who an hour or two earlier boasted that he was ready to die for Jesus? Now he can't even keep his eyes open. What, was he sleeping because he was tired? Or, or was it his body's reaction to the stress and avoidance mechanism, not wanting to face the hard things that Jesus has been talking about? Peter had every intention of rising to the occasion. He wanted to meet the challenge, to be a good friend, to be a worthy disciple. But he wasn't prepared to acknowledge his own weakness. He failed to begin where he was with his own inadequacy. And instead, he made promises he couldn't keep and then fell asleep at the switch. I know your human spirit is willing, Jesus tells him, but your human strength isn't going to be enough this time. So he gives Peter and the others another chance. Watch and pray, he says. And then he returns to his own struggle. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it, is possible for this, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Now, there's some movement here. This is a slightly different prayer than the first time. If it is not possible, he says. So he's beginning to understand that, that maybe there is no other way. There's no lamb in the thicket as there was for Abraham. He understands that, that he has a decision to make. And make no mistake, it was a decision. From a human perspective, Jesus had the opportunity to say no, to not go through with it. I mean, we, we could call it the last temptation of Christ, his last chance to go his own way rather than his Father's way. He sees what needs to be done, and he wants to say yes, but he's not quite there yet. This prayer, this journey isn't over. So he takes another break and goes to, back to check on his so-called friends. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. It's his third time around now, and Jesus is still finding the words, still finding his way to the Father's will and to saying yes. There's nothing wrong with praying for the same thing over and over. Now, hopefully, it's, it's not exactly the same prayer each time. Hopefully, there's movement in our minds and spirits as, as we bring it before the Lord again and again. Remember, it's a journey, not a transaction. It can take a while to discern what God is up to. <laughs> and it can take a while longer for our hearts to embrace that thing. And eventually, Jesus gets there. Something happened that third time around. Now, Matthew leaves us in the dark about it, but Luke pulls back the curtain just a bit. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Now, what did that look like? An angel hovering in the olive branches? I don't think so. But somehow, through persistent prayer and with an angel's help, Jesus found strength to surrender to his Father's will. And by the time he rises from prayer the third time, he's in a very different place, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Well, let's look at the final verses. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. He's not flat on his face anymore, is he? He's not overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's on his feet. He's in command of himself and the moment. 
I don't know how you picture this moment, but the image that comes to my mind, and, and I feel a little foolish saying it, is Tom Brady roaming the sidelines with two minutes to go in the game, rousing his teammates to action. Let's go! I mean, talk about a transformation. Jesus is ready now to meet the challenge to fulfill his calling. Unlike his disciples who are still sleeping in the moonlight. So, so what happened here? How did Jesus get from take this cup away to rise, let's go? He got there by prayer by bringing his stress to his heavenly Father and by pressing into prayer till he found what he needed. So how about this? Change happens when we pray our way from self-reliance to surrender. See, the difference between Jesus and the disciples is that they were still relying on their own will their own strength, their own resolve, declaring themselves ready to die with Jesus. But when the moment came, stress got the best of them. They decided they needed sleep more than prayer, and they failed miserably. Jesus, on the other hand, found a time and a place and a posture for prayer. And beginning where he was, he found words to express what he was feeling and thinking, and he kept finding words until he found his way to the Father's heart and to the strength to do what was being asked of him. Change happens when we pray our way from self-reliance to surrender. Now, now, surrender isn't about giving up or giving in. It's about giving over giving our stress over to God, bringing it to Him in prayer again and again till, till we find our way to what God is up to. So we begin where we are. Lord, someone I love is sick and I want them to be well. But that's just the beginning of the journey. As we press on in prayer, we we begin to discern what God might be up to. Maybe he's revealing himself to that sick person in ways they'd never known him before. Maybe he's working through that person to point others to himself. Maybe he's giving you an opportunity to care for that person or to point them towards him. Maybe he's setting the stage for a miraculous healing. Or maybe he's preparing hearts for that person's homegoing. We don't always know at first where our prayers will lead. We don't always feel at first like we have the strength to face what's coming. But prayer is a journey, not a transaction. And when we stick with it, we not only find out what God is up to, we find strength to say yes to it. A couple of illustrations might help. In our staff chapel this past week, our Watertown Children's Director, Leanne, shared a story. In the early stages of the pandemic, she was a hospice worker at the height of the surge in Boston. It was an incredibly stressful time, physically and emotionally working long hours, scrambling to find masks and medications, carrying people's pain as they face death and loss. On top of that were her own fears, working in risky environments while pregnant with their first child. It was a spiritual struggle, too. She says, I often felt like I wasn't the right person for this job. I'm shy. I don't always have the right words to say. How could I ever provide enough comfort and support when there was so much grieving and suffering? I often wondered, God, why did you choose me to live through this? Isn't there someone who is more equipped? It's not quite, take this cup from me, but it's close. 
There was no angel involved that we know of, but, but as Leanne wrestled with these things in prayer, the Lord brought to her mind the story of, of Esther, a hesitant and unlikely person, and yet God had placed her right where she was supposed to be and strengthened her to do what was needed in that moment. And Leanne realized that God could and would do the same thing for her. And looking back now, she recognizes the many ways God was at work in the situation. She says, The help came to me in beautiful ways. Distant friends sent me an extra package of N95s on the very day I was worrying about that. Friends from the Watertown campus checked in with us and delivered meals when our daughter was born. I was able to use my skills as a music therapist to play concerts outside of nursing homes. I treasure the memory of recording the violin for online worship in the empty sanctuary in Watertown. In a season of stress, Leanne looked to God in prayer, not knowing where it would lead and, and how she would meet the challenge in front of her. The stress didn't suddenly disappear. But as days went by, she began to see what God was up to. She found strength to say yes to what he was asking of her. Change happens when we pray our way from self-reliance to surrender. Now, surrender isn't passive, letting things happen to us. It's, it's active, taking hold of the situation and bringing it to God. Surrender isn't weakness, giving in to stress or evil. It's finding the strength to face it and rise above it in ways that are good for us and for the world. On a, on a more personal note, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was up late on a Wednesday night trying to finish my sermon. I had to record it the next morning, and, and I just couldn't land the final page. I wrote and rewrote but, but the later it got, the more stressed I felt and the, and the worse my writing became. When it got to be about midnight, I, I just gave up and told myself to, to, to get some sleep and, and get up early when, when I do my best work. But, but just before flopping down on the couch, it struck me that I hadn't really prayed about it that evening. And, and I almost felt too ashamed to pray at that point. But I hit my knees beside the couch and said out loud, Lord, I've got nothing. I don't know how to finish this sermon. And as I, as I told him what I was trying to say, what, what I felt he wanted me to say, the words suddenly fell into place. One sentence, one paragraph after another. And after a few minutes of prayer, I hopped up and went to my laptop and quickly tapped out a few lines so I'd remember them in the morning, which I did. And later that morning, I looked into the camera and preached with joy and confidence, knowing that God had met me and that I had a word from him for his people. And for a pastor, it doesn't get any better than that. So, what are you stressed about today? Inflation? Global unrest? The pandemic? Maybe it's something more personal, at home or work or school. When might you find time to pray about it this week? Where might you go this week to spend time with the Lord? Who might you ask to keep watch with you? What words might you use to express what you're thinking and feeling? Begin there. And don't stop till you find your way to the Father's heart. Well, we'd like to give you a moment to begin that journey right here, right now. So, I'll get us started with a few words of prayer, and, and then I'll offer you some quiet time to, to find your own words, to bring whatever is on your heart to the Lord. And after a few moments, 
and I'll invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me using the words sins and sinners. Now, if it helps, you might want to put yourself in a posture of prayer, hands up maybe, or on your knees, whatever feels right. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this image of Jesus pouring his heart out to you in prayer. Thank you for a Savior who can sympathize with us in our weakness and even in our stress. Thank you for the freedom to come to you now as we are with whatever is on our hearts. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen.